For the final video in this series on Baroque dance forms, I will be discussing the Gig. And as one last reminder, don't forget to check out my own Baroque suite for two violins, which was released in conjunction with these videos. The purchase link is in the description. The Gig is typically the last dance of a Baroque suite, and is characterized by a quick tempo. But before we get into the traits of the Gig, we need to discuss the origins of the dance. The Gig, like the Sarabande, has very mysterious beginnings. It is not entirely known what form the earliest Gigs took. However, some vague information surrounding the genesis of the Gig is common knowledge. Firstly, we know the Gig, or Jig, as it was called, comes from the British Isles. Many variant spellings of Jig exist, and only enhances the difficulty of determining the etymology of the word. There are several theories, but I enjoy one particular theory, which is that it stems from the medieval Italian word giga, or medieval French word gig for the fiddle. Whether merited or not, I think many people associate the fiddle with the jig, since the jig remains popular to this very day in Ireland and is often performed on the fiddle, so thus connecting the two seems logical. The word Giga survives in the extant German word for violin, which is Geige. Although this is personally my favorite theory, other theories as to the word's etymology propose that Jig originated as a slang term much like the term Jazz did, or that it comes from the Old French verb Giguer, meaning to leap or frolic. It is not just the etymology of the word Jig that remains enigmatic either, as very little information survives as to the characteristics of early English Jigs. And from what little evidence remains, it appears that the word jig was more or less an all-encompassing term for many types of music during the late Renaissance in England. It does, however, seem that the early jig did, like the Sarabande, have a salacious and vulgar characteristic, and is mentioned in such a light in Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. It wouldn't be until the middle of the 17th century that the English jig would begin to evolve into the form it would take in the Baroque suites of the late Baroque period. A notable example of an early English jig is Matthew Locke's jig from his suite in B-flat major. <laughs> By the end of the 17th century, the English composer Henry Purcell began setting the benchmark for what the jig would ultimately become. Many of these techniques and rhythmic standards would spread rapidly throughout Europe by the turn of the 18th century. In France, the jig, as it was called in French, would often be written with more complex contrapuntal techniques and would at times become so muddled with meandering contrapuntal phrases that many of the standard jig traits became harder to notice. In Italy, the giga, as it was called there, adopted a more streamlined and homophonic character, which I personally prefer as it enables the rhythmic characteristics of the jig to really stand out. German composers, on the other hand, seem to meld both aspects of the contrapuntal French jig with the homophonic Italian giga. Due to there being a dizzying amount of exceptions to what constitutes a gig, it's almost impossible to lay out a framework of rules that definitively define a gig. So in order to continue, please keep in mind the rules I will be laying out going forward are more of an aggregate of the standard practices adopted by French, Italian, and German composers of the late Baroque. So what are these traits? First of all, it's important to lay out that jigs are generally fairly quick in tempo and are written in either 3 8 time or a compound meter derivative thereof, such as 6 8 9 8 or 12 8 time. As for an upbeat, this is up to the composer, as jigs can either have a short upbeat or no upbeat at all. A jig also usually makes use of aspects of this rhythm. Bits and pieces of this rhythm are somewhat essential in order to convincingly convey a gig. As with most of the Baroque dances I have so far laid out in this series, 
Jigs are almost always written in binary form. The rules for which I have explained extensively in my other videos on Baroque forms. But when it comes to the form, a couple of techniques a composer can use are of important note. One aspect is that jigs often have A and B sections of equal length like the Allemande. Another trait found often in the A section, but also the B section of a jig, is the beloved practice among many Baroque jigs of employing contrapuntal imitation. I use this technique at the beginning of my own jig. In the B section, another possible technique a composer can employ is to mirror the initial motif of the A section. We can see this in Handel's jig from his keyboard suite in F minor. I feel a lot of the contrapuntal spirit associated with the Gig lived on in classical music even after the Gig was no longer in vogue. I think an interesting spiritual relative of the Gig is found in the scherzo of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Although it's written in three-quarter time, it could very easily be heard as twelve-eighth time, and shares much of the feeling of a Baroque Gig, from its rhythm down to its masterful counterpoint. This highlights why I think it's ultimately important to discuss old forms because they help us gain a deeper understanding of music. Before I get to the conclusion of this video and ultimately this series, let's do a quick recap. Jigs are quick in tempo. They employ either 3 8 time or the compound meter derivatives thereof, are written in binary form, can be either homophonic or contrapuntal in character, or both, are written with or without an upbeat. Lastly, and something I didn't mention, is that jigs are there to end your suite. So thus, it's important to experiment a bit, and that's why I think the jig is somewhat more vague than the other forms, because so many composers use it to basically do whatever they want within the form. And I think that's your goal as a composer if you ever write a jig. So with all that out of the way, and in ending this series, I would just like to mention that this will not be, by any means, the end of me discussing Baroque dance forms, as there are many more to discuss, but I will save those for a later date. I hope nonetheless that these videos have been helpful, and I look forward to explaining more musical forms in the future. And one last time, don't forget to check out my own Baroque suite, linked in the description below.